So my name is Simon Garnier, and as uh, you can probably hear from my accent, I come all the way from New Jersey today. <laughs> this joke always works. Um, but I was born and raised in France, obviously. Um, and when I was a kid, or since I was a kid, I have this problem. Um, I get bored so easily. I don't know, is it your case for you as well? Do you get bored easily? Yeah, I do all the time. I always need to do something new, something different. When I was a kid, I played all these sports. I did rugby and soccer and track and field. And now I play this sport called uh, Olympic handball or European handball. Have you heard of European handball? It's like water polo, but on land. So, um, as I said, I get bored very easily, and that's fine when you're a kid, because there's lots of things to do when you're a kid, but when you grow up and you become an adult, that's kind of a problem, right? You have to find a job, and most jobs out there, well, you do the same thing over and over every day. And that's not going to work for me, right? I cannot do the same thing over and over every day. So I had to find a job that allowed me to do everything I wanted all the time, whenever I wanted. And that job, the perfect job for that, <laughs> is to be a scientist, and in particular to be a biologist, okay? And I'm a biologist at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. It's a, a small but very vibrant university, not very far from Manhattan in Newark. And there I, uh, I have my lab, and we study intelligence. But we're not studying the intelligence of the brain, we study what we call collective intelligence. So the intelligence of the crowd, the intelligence of groups. But to explain a little bit better what collective intelligence is, we're going to do a couple of experiments together. Are you okay with that? All right, for the first experiment, we're going to do it here on the stage. I need a couple of volunteers, so round of applause for the volunteers. Thank you. What's your name? Kathleen Zuri. and Zuri. Nice to meet you. So, do you know what these are? Yes, they are metronomes, right? We use them normally when you play the music. Now, what I'm going to ask you is, can you, can you start them, these three of them that are on the table? Can you keep them, get them started for me? Just come here. Don't be afraid, they're not biting. Oh, I think. All right. Just keep it out, and then... All right, and the last one. You just, you just need to push it a little bit inside, like this. All right. Then move a little bit so people can see. All right. We're going to slow this one a little bit. So what you see is just what metronomes do. They beat at a particular speed. In this particular case, we set them up at 160, 176 BPM. Right? But do you see anything particular that they're doing, except moving back and forth? The answer is no, so you can say no. <laughs> right? That's the boring part of the experiment. No, let, let me stop them, because this is really, really annoying. So, can you help me stop this one? All right. So this is what happens when you take three metronomes, you put them on a table, and uh, they are just doing their thing. Now, here I have a second experiment. In this experiment, this is the three same metronomes, same models. The only difference is now they are on this board that is sitting on these two cans of soda. Very unstable board. Oh. Good. Okay, so we're going to repeat the same experiment, but this time on this board, and we're going to see if something else happens. Do you want to help me? Up oh, this one. All right, we're going to start them. And we're going to wait a few seconds. What's happening? Do you see something happening here? Wow, science! <laughs> All right, help me stop them. All good? All right, thank you very much for your help. You can go back to your seats. Did they almost? Yeah, we, we put like a little stops there. <laughs> we know science always breaks at some point. <laughs> Don't move. All right, so this was a little demonstration to show you um, how uh, different objects, as soon as you put them, as you couple them with each other, in this particular case, they are coupled with each other because they can both all move this little board, and by moving this little board, they apply forces on the other metronomes, slightly slowing each other down or speeding each other down up until they get in perfect synchrony. This is an experiment with three metronomes, but you can find videos online, if uh, we can play on the screen, with up to, in this particular case, 64 metronomes. We didn't do it with 64 metronomes, because that would take a long time before they synchronize, but it will work. You can do this with 64 of them, except for that guy there. 
There's always, there's always one who's trying to be interesting. <laughs> All right? But we can do this with a lot more than 64 individuals. So we're going to do that second experiment, and now everybody is going to participate. OK? You OK? All right, I'm going to ask you to do something. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. OK? Do not reach into your neighbor's pocket while you're doing this. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and on my cue, I'm going to ask you to start clapping in your hand. But as you're clapping, wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. We're going to close our eyes, start clapping, and as you clap, I'm, ask, I'm asking you to listen to your neighbors, the people around you, and try to match your clapping speed with their clapping speed. Does it make sense? All right, so close your eyes. Everybody close their eyes. I know you can start clapping. All right, thank you very much. You can stop. You did it, well done. All right, so similar, you did the same thing as the metronome did. You listened to each other, you adjusted to the behavior of each other, and then you managed to all come in synchrony. But what's even more fascinating with this experiment is not that you all managed to synchronize, is that you all decided collectively to synchronize on a particular frequency, on a particular speed of clapping and nobody told you which speed it was supposed to be, right? You all collectively agree on that particular speed. And if you repeat the experiments, you might agree on a different speed. Right? And that's what we call collective intelligence, the ability of the group here to organize itself without having anyone in particular in charge in the group. Nobody told you to synchronize on that speed, yet you did it. Okay? So that's collective intelligence is present everywhere in nature. Everywhere you look, it's present in nature. And sometimes it has some really funny consequences, like in the video of the puppies that we're going to see right now. This is the cutest video you'll see today. So this is the same principle, right? The puppy pushes the puppy that pushes the puppy, and then this pinwheel gets started and will not stop until uh, all the food in the bowl is consumed. OK, so that's kind of a silly example. But actually, in nature, you can find some of these examples that are a lot smarter than that. And I'm going to show you here now a video of ants, a species of ants that I study in Panama, in the tropical forest in Panama. These are called army ants. They move through the forest, they form these very long trails of ants through the forest, and then they have to uh, find, uh, pass obstacles like these gaps. In this particular case, it's an experiment we've done with them. But they are uh, using their collective intelligence. They're capable of bridging these gaps, right? Even if the, gap, uh, the bridge breaks, it will self-repair, a little bit like the liquid material that we've seen before. And um, thanks to this, that allow them to uh, optimize their path through the forest. They can go faster to the food sources because they're capable of, uh, instead of having to go around the gap, they can go directly through it. Now, that's one example. This is my second favorite species of ant in the world, army ants. Remember that if you go to uh, Central and South America. But if you go to Northern Australia, there's my favorite species of ant, which I call weaver ants. If we can put in the video of the weaver ants. These are ants that form, they build their nest, by bending and folding leaves together and then stitching them with silk. And this is little experiments we've done where you can see these ants. These are the most beautiful ants in the world, in my opinion. Uh, a single ant here will not be capable of folding that leaf. A single ant is not strong enough. But by working together, by forming these chains, they're capable of pulling and exerting extreme, uh, extremely uh, strong forces on the leaves that allow them to bend them together. Right? Now, one of the uh, best aspects of my work is I get to study these uh, fascinating organisms in the wild, but I also get to work with engineers and social scientists and criminologists and all sorts of people outside of my field to bring the principle of uh, science that we've discovered with these species and then bring them to try to figure out like, real-life application for them. So for instance, uh, you might not know that, but companies like Amazon that have big warehouses, companies like this, they have fleets of robots inside their warehouses that works a little bit like the ants do, 
and to reorganize the warehouse. So you have these fleets of robots, like lens, go around, move products around to be better organize the warehouse instead of having humans do it. Right? Similar things, every time Amazon or one of these companies ships you packages, they have to decide where the package is going before it goes to your home. And they have to optimize that. And they use algorithms that are actually inspired from the behavior of the ants. And I'm, what I'm saying inspired from them, the algorithms are called ant colony optimization algorithm, ACO, if you uh, study this in, in school later. And these algorithms have been invented because we've studied the ants in the first place. Now, I also work in my, uh, in my lab. We work with criminologists and the Newark Police Department developing software to, to uh, facilitate, uh, to do what we call policing, predictive policing, sorry, which is the idea of trying to forecast where and when crime is likely to happen in the next week, in the next month, etc. But my favorite type of application, like the one that I really love, is what we're going to see in the, in the next video. Um, it's these uh, robots, so these are not my robots, I didn't make them. They are called hypercells, and they are other type of robots like this. But they are fascinating because these robots can attach and detach from each other, a little bit like the army ants that we've seen before. And by attaching and detaching from each other, they are capable of forming these beautiful structures. Uh, and these structures can be formed everywhere, and they can form any structure anywhere in the world. They don't, need called, they don't need anyone to give them a plan. They do this all by themselves. Okay? So these are prototypes. Right? They've been uh, created a few years ago. Uh, but maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, when all of you young people here work for NASA, you might be sending some of these robots to Mars, but fleets of them that will be able to build houses for us on Mars before we actually go and move in a bit these planets. Because we don't know what we'll find on Mars, so we need to be able to send something that will be able to build in any kind of environment. So I'm almost, it's almost done with my time on stage. Uh, I wanted just to uh, summarize a little bit why my job is so cool and why I think it's one of the coolest jobs you can have. First, you get to travel a lot, right? I travel all around the world. You get to study really funky and weird and exotic species of ants and other animals. We also work with elephants and baboons and goats for some reason. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, but I also get to play with a lot of cool toys, like technology you haven't seen yet, uh, things that might actually never come out of the lab, and we get to participate in the building of these new technologies. And um, also, we get also, from time to time, uh, we can help a little bit society get a little bit better. But that's not the best thing about my job. As I said, I get easily bored. In that job, I never get to do two, twice the same thing in a row. Right? Tomorrow, I'll be working with data that were, were collected on elephants. And then maybe next week, I'll be working on ants in the lab. Next month, I'll be in Europe. Next year, I'll be in Australia. Right? So if you don't want to get bored in your life, and if you're looking for the perfect job for that, become a biologist. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.